Good evening, film fans. I'm Mark Evanier, and every Tuesday evening, to pass the time while we're all isolated and in our fortresses of solitude, I uh, have been calling a friend of mine up to talk, sometimes for hours on end, somebody I haven't talked to enough lately. And at some point, I decided to let all you folks listen in and participate in the discussion. And this evening, we're going to spend some time with my longtime buddy. And I think, and I'll say this, but he's not on camera, so he doesn't have to worry about blushing. I think the best film historian and film critic that this business has ever seen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Leonard Moulton here. Hello, sir. Oh, shucks, Mark. Oh, yes. Shucks. Good. Um, very, very generous introduction. Yes. Well, I'll tell you very interestingly here, I'm looking, I am looking. I can see a counter that tells how many people are watching this telecast at the moment. And it just jumped. <laughs> it was at zero when I started that sentence, and it just jumped to 45. I think it was kicking in and stuff. Move, and in, move a little closer, folks. Move in a that's little right. Closer. That's right. Film, would you film the empty? Oh, no. They're, they're social distancing out there is what they're doing. Okay. Oh, that's right. As they should. As yes. They should. Yes, Leonard is a little low in the frame, partly because he's having trouble with his adjusting his camera, and partly because he wants to show off the Frizz Freeling drawing on his wall. I think it's it's a little of each. Yes, that drawing is that drawing is higher than Frizz Freeling was. It's amazing. <laughs> Frizz, Frizz was about what two foot three or something like that. He was a very little tiny guy with a very was, large voice. Yeah. yeah, he was proportioned not unlike seventy cents. Yes, that's right. If he had let his mustache grow, he would have. You know, anyway. Um, Leonard, do you remember how we met? Um, a mutual friend said he thought we would get along together, and we made a lunch date. That's what I recall. That's pretty much it. Well, what happened was that I knew who you were. I was following you. I was I was a subscriber to Film Fan Monthly when you were publishing that. I bought every book you did. Um, my copy of, of A Mice and Men was sacred and much read and, uh, and that mice and magic a mice and magic yes yeah so, some some guy named steinbeck ripped off your title for yeah did another book yeah and um uh then and but i had people i knew who were saying uh tell your friend leonard malton he was wrong about this movie tell your friend leonard malton this and i said i've never met leonard malton and he said they said you haven't and and i said no and he said well you guys should know each other because you're interested in all the same stuff and they were people were telling you the same thing about me yeah so one day when I, go ahead i was gonna say just a little background detail at that time i was living in new york with my wife alice and commuting to los angeles every couple of weeks to tape segments for entertainment tonight back and forth back and forth that's right. So one day I was working on I was working on the TV show That's Incredible, mm -hmm. which was on the old Columbia lot. We were doing it. We we're at Sunset Gower Studio. And I got a call one day from you and said, I'm in town for this. I've got some time. Everybody says we ought to meet. Let's get together for lunch and see if we hate each other. So you came over. That effect. Yes. And and we went to lunch. We had a great time. And we I took you on a tour of the, what was left of the Columbia lot. And we found there's a space where I was parking my car, and there's a photo in movie comedy teams, one edition, of the Three Stooges standing in that exact same spot in 1945 or something like that. It looks exactly – it hasn't been clean since then. Nothing's been upgraded. It's the exact same space except that my car is not in the shot. And, um, and, we, and then after that, every time you came out here, we would have dinner – at the Numero Uno Pizzeria over on La Cienega, where we, we pardon? Of the love of memory. Yes, yes. We're having a little clipping of the ends of your sentences and things here, but it'll, 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 it should adjust itself in a moment or two. And um, uh, we talked about the possibility of you moving out here permanently to work full time on Entertainment Tonight and discuss that. And, uh, and we just, you know, all of a sudden I had a new best friend. It was very, very simple. And I took you to some fun places in L.A. you didn't know about. And, and we talked about movies ad infinitum, trivia like you would not believe. It was, uh, uh, as we were going to prove over the next hour or so. And we have, we've never stopped. 
No, no, it ha goes on like that. Um, I was trying to decide what we should talk about first, and then Carl Reiner died. So we should talk about Carl Reiner. You yes, must have interviewed, interviewed him a few times. I did. Do you uh, know anybody who ever met Carl Reiner who didn't like him? No. No, I don't. And uh, yeah. Go ahead. I, uh, he was just a very likable guy. There's a good Yiddish word, Hamisha. Uh, he, he was a Hamisha guy, uh, a, a comfortable guy to be around, who made you feel comfortable, uh, yeah. who, who was the opposite of intimidating, whatever the opposite is. And uh, he, he was also approachable. And uh, I, I met him on numerous occasions, several formal type sit down interviews but also just casual conversations. And uh, he was just, in fact, I got to interview him uh, one time at a luncheon for um, our public television station, KCET. And I threw him a curve that I felt pretty confident he could handle because I've, oh, I always loved watching him do double talk Shakespeare. And, uh, and he did. He did, and, and he explained how it came about, that he actually was with an acting troupe when he was very young, before your show of shows with Sid Caesar. And uh, this was, you know, this is not a comedic troupe. It was a, 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 a drama ensemble, and he did perform Shakespeare. And so he got into the iambic pentameter. He understood the rhythm of the words. And, but, but, but because he was so brilliant, and could do, you know, uh, like Caesar, like said Caesar, he could do Italian double talk and French double talk. He could do Shakespeare double talk. Yeah, it was amazing that Mr. Caesar just happened to gather with him Howie Morris and, and Carl Reiner, who were proficient in that kind of, of foreign gibberish. I mean, yeah. that they could they could do any dialect and, and any language and such. Um, I found Mr. Reiner uh, when I was I was working on the Paramount lot briefly on the worst experience I ever had working in television. I won't mention the name of the show. It was MacGyver. And uh, uh, he was doing filming something on the lot at the time. And I kept seeing him walking around the lot, singing out loud and delighting people and saying hello to everybody. I, I just, I don't think I ever saw anyone who fit the definition of a star by any definition, who was as friendly and approachable and outgoing. And he was like that. Um, as I've told, I think I must have told you that I told everybody how I went when I was like 12 or 13 years old, I went to a filming of the Dick Van Dyke show, a very life changing moment in my life. And uh, uh, he was the MC that night. Maury Amsterdam had invited us, my family and I to this. And then Maury wasn't in the episode that week that we went. Otherwise, he would have been doing the warm up with Rose Marie. So Carl did it. And he was so funny. And so good, I, the show had trouble following the warm-up because he was so good. And uh, and then Dick came out, and he was charming and funny. You know, you just you, if you can fall in love with someone as a personality. And then Mary Tyler Moore came out, and I reached puberty at that moment. It was it was <laughs> frightening. I mean, uh, for, many years, for many years, Carl Reiner emceed the annual Directors Guild awards mm -hmm. and uh they they kept inviting him back because he was so good and uh, one night decades ago my wife and i attended and it was at the uh, sheraton uh sheraton universal or the universal hilton there two hotels side by side on top of that mountain there where the universal theme park is and we had just finished having dinner typical you know what the hell was that you know uh, banquet dinner and Carl gets up and says right away what the hell was that we just ate <laughs> he said what we all had on our minds you know in just the right manner that if you had been the chef I don't think you'd have been insulted uh, because he was so genial about it I, I gave him a joke once we were at a testimonial to uh, Nanette Fabre, mm -hmm. and uh, Sid Caesar was announced as a speaker, he didn't show up. So I went to Carl before the thing happened. I, I, he remembered me kind of vaguely, and I suggested this to him. 
and he came out and he said, uh, uh, Sid Caesar was supposed to be here tonight, but he was not able to make it. But he did send a letter, and then Carl opens up an envelope, takes out what I guess was a blank piece of paper, and he did four minutes of double talk German. <laughs> Sid said, and he did most of which I can't do, obviously. And it, it was very funny, and he was like one of the only guys in the world who could have done that joke uh, so well. No, he, he just was very. Was it? Yeah. He, sorry. He directed a, a very uh, entertaining movie called uh, Oh God. Yes. Starring, uh, George Burns and uh, John Denver. And uh, when it came out on DVD years later, I think this was on DVD, it must have been DVD because there was a commentary track. He did the commentary track. And I was just going to listen to a little bit of it, but he was so amusing and interesting, I played the whole, the whole movie that way. And uh, so... I'm a big believer in, in writing letters, fan letters, letters of, you know, of support, letters of approbation, uh, all of that. And I just sent him a quick note saying what a pleasure it was to listen to him and how I enjoyed seeing the movie all over again. And, and congratulations. And two or three weeks later, uh, Alice and I went to a, a movie at the New Art Theater on the west side of town. And I think we're going to see a foreign film. And who was arriving at the same moment to see that same foreign film, but Mr. and Mrs. Reiner, Mr. and Mrs. Brooks. And Carl saw me and then did a double take uh, and came over and said, you, you just wrote me that nice letter. I said, yes, I did. He said, it was so sweet of you. That was Carl Reiner. Yeah, he was he's like that. Let's talk about some of his movies. Um, by just well, coincidence, best, I think. What? Oh, oh God, was it probably the best? I are you a fan of Where's Papa? Not so much. I I liked Where's Papa tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, it's That's so a movie for some people. Well, it's it's a very. I, I understand why some people don't like it, but there's just something about it that's hard to, hard to take your eyes off. It's 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 very funny in in, very, in certain places, and uh, uh, he did a movie that is almost disappeared. Uh, actually, he wrote this; he didn't direct it. Um, the Art of Love with Dick Van Dyke and James Garner. Mm -hmm. And I seem to be the only person in the world who remembers that movie or liked it. I asked Dick Van Dyke about it, and he kind of went like, oh, that one, yeah. You know, It, it didn't stand out for him. I remember being uh, enormously entertained by that film. Um, I have not seen it since it opens. Yeah, and then I just, a week or two ago, by coincidence, I just have, I have this DVD carousel in my office, and I just kind of spin it sometime and, and see what I get. And I was watching The Thrill of It All with James uh, Garner and Doris Day. Very funny uh, movie. Very funny. We directed by uh, Norman Jewison and Larry Gilbart worked on the script with Carl and Carl is in it in cameo roles. And the whole trailer for that the film is, Car is, Car is Carl discussing the movie and showing clips from it. Uh, but um, he did a, I, I would guess The Jerk was one of the most successful comedy films ever made. Certainly and, fine. Uh, speaking, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh you know, people don't think of him as a, as a film director sometimes, but uh, and and here, here's a question which I I actually to I went to two or three people who were interviewing Carl and I said, would you ask him this question? Because I didn't get a chance to ask him this, and I and he never got a I never got a satisfactory answer. Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks were best friends for like 70 years. They each directed, you know what? 15, 20 movies, whatever it is. How come neither of them is ever in one of each other's movies? <laughs> they never cast each other once uh, in anything. Yes. Interesting. I mean, uh, I, an amateur psychiatrist or psychologist could go to town and have uh, have fun with that, that question, answering yeah. that conundrum. Yeah. Mel Which cast... Yeah, Mel casts Sid Caesar twice in his movies, neither time giving him a speaking part. One was in silent movie. Uh, but uh, Carl never cast anybody from the show of shows. He didn't put Howie Morris, I don't think, in anything he did, or or Nanette Fabre, or Imogene Coca, or anybody like that. Um, so I, I don't know why that is. I mean, and, and yet he worked, uh, as you say, several times with Larry Gelbart. 
and they had met on your show of shows. And he worked with Aaron, Aaron Rubin, and he wrote the comic together, right. uh, which is a, a very underrated film, I think, um, and uh, uh, a very good film. I think that's like Dick, maybe Dick Van Dyke's best movie role ever. Uh, uh, do you have any other favorite Carl Reiner movies? Anything? Uh, well, he's very good in... The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. Yes. Where he played uh, essentially a straight character for directing Norman Jewison. I, I think he played the, the the character that was written for Dick Van Dyke, and they couldn't get Dick. Is I think what he did, <laughs> what he did in that. But but uh, yeah, no, he's quite wonderful in that. Um, and uh, and he is. We we are now just about out of people who are in. It's a mad, 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 mad world. Uh, yeah, uh, the ranks down. are at an alarming rate. Mark. Yeah, yeah, frightening. But. Um, he, uh, um, you know, the, oh, oh God was a very popular film. Uh, oh, oh God, you know, helped was one of the building blocks that helped rebuild George Burns' starring career. Yeah, which had never been. He had never been a star in movies. He, he, had, he and Gracie got you know proper billing when they appeared in in movies together in the thirties and forties. But George Burns as a solo had never been featured so prominently or or or, uh, or built up to start him the way he, he he was in the last years of his life that's right yeah he was it was it was sunshine boys and and oh god and a couple of cameos in lesser films and then uh what was, what was the one with lee strasberg and art carney uh wow, that's a very good movie yes that's right yeah um uh, which he's quite wonderful. He's, they're all wonderful in that film. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, and also, I think we should mention oh, something. Enter Laughing. Oh, and Enter Laughing, yeah. Um, now, my wife and I have the distinction of having seen a musical called So Long 174th Street, Yeah. which was a Broadway musical adaptation of his autobiographical book and play, and her laughing, uh, with Robert leading role, and George S. Irving uh, in a wonderfully juicy supporting role as, as the butler, who has a, a hilarious song. And there is a cast album. Uh, the, there's a, there's, there is a YouTube video that my friend Jim Brochu and his husband Steve put together on YouTube of George S. Irving singing that song uh, at some theater group fairly recently uh not long before mr irving left us he to appear in the revival yeah yeah he yeah, it's amazing uh leonard your your voice is breaking up a little bit here uh i i hope that the audience isn't too uh uh discomforted by it we have a little weird internet connection here we'll we'll we'll, we'll tough it out here but if i keep asking you to repeat things it's not your fault. It's it's uh, Bill Gates's or somebody's. If it get if it gets really obnoxious, I'll I'll hang up and try to reconnect. Yeah. Okay. But we'll, we'll we'll try that. Um, but um, uh, we have a couple of things we have that we should people should say about Carl Reiner. I can't think of anybody who was ever a better talk show guest than Carl Reiner, and he actually managed to be on every version of the Tonight Show with every host at one time or another. I think he was probably on every major talk show that ever existed. Sure. And he was wonderful on all of them, every single one. I mean, always, he was an example of exactly the kind of guest uh, that people wanted. He came on, he had a funny self-deprecating story or two, and he was up for anything. And he would, add, he he would play games. And, he gave himself a cameo in Oh God, Playing himself, being a guest on the Dinah Shore show. Yeah, he he was in. He had he, he did Hitchcocky and cameos in most of them. In fact, in th in the thrill of it all, um, in the opening credits, there's you know a, a credit for gowns by so and so, jewels by so and so, and it says cameos by Carl Reiner in it. <laughs> the opening credits, and he's has a couple of cameo appearances in the film. Um, yeah, just. Uh, Anyway, the, the thing that always was interesting to me about him is here's a guy who basically worked constantly from about 1947 on, usually in something very good. Uh, I don't think he was ever out of work at any point in his career, unless he chose to be out of take time off. And he didn't really care if he was the star of anything. In, in all those years, there was never the Carl Reiner show. 
he was he he did you know he supported Sid Caesar. He supported Dick Van Dyke. He supported Mel Brooks. In the movies, he supported Steve Martin, and John. he made other people look good his whole career. Yeah. And yeah. no, nobody had a better career in, in their in their lives than Carl Reiner. No, and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, three uh, three children. You know that uh, he he was close to, and grandchildren. And uh, uh, and I I know that there was always uh, in recent years. Uh, kind of a tug uh, at his heartstrings at, at the loss of his wife Estelle. They were married for more than sixty years, and uh, uh, so uh, that's something you don't necessarily get over or get past. Yeah, there were people who envied anybody who was a guest, and I, I never got to be one at Carl's house to sit there and watch Jeopardy with Mel every night and a movie. <laughs> and uh, um, it, it's kind of colorful these guys hung out together every night practically and uh um uh, you know went through the loss of their wives held each other's hands for through through yeah. that another another long marriage um uh, yeah. and you know uh, somebody just somebody just wrote uh, in the in the uh in the chat room just wrote carl reiner always seemed to me to be a nexus point for american comedy from the 50s to 70s and he probably was in cross paths with every major comedian at some point and uh i would i would say so it, it's stunning the number of people today on facebook who posted photos with him mm -hmm. yeah and 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 people who could quote two thousand year old man routines yeah. uh very easily so uh uh yeah just an amazing guy i want to go back to a couple of the questions we've had here uh uh somebody wrote uh I wish Amazon Prime's version of The Russians Are Coming wasn't screwed up. It doesn't have any subtitles for the Russian dialogue. I don't remember subtitles for the Russian dialogue in that film at all. I don't, there, think, I don't think there I think, were either. I think they gave the audience credit for understanding the gist of what they were saying. Yeah, I think that's, that's if true. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but that, that's, that's my recollection. They may have, maybe, they, maybe it's like a couple of films. They released it both ways and tried different... Uh, mm -hmm. Prince of that. Uh, uh, ben Barkenton points out Mrs. Reiner was in a Brooks movie. That's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. Carl wasn't, but 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 his wife was. Um, let's see here. We got a couple. Uh, oh, okay. Mark Martirosian says, "Hey, Leonard, great interview with Haley Mills. Watched it when I really needed some Pollyanna sunshine. Your daughter's questions were sweet and on point as well." Thank you, and thank well, you on my behalf. When did you interview Haley Mills? About a month ago, uh, on the 60th anniversary of Pollyanna, oh. uh, and uh, did this for D23, the Disney, the official Disney fan club, and we did it uh, this way on Zoom uh, from London. And she's and she had been on our podcast uh, two years ago or so, so we had met her before and spoken to her, and we already knew how charming and delightful she was, and this just reinforced that. Yeah. Anyway, at the night we went to that thing at, at the academy for Richard Sherman, mm -hmm. uh, Shelley Goldstein and I went together, and we were sitting next to the Haley Mills party, mm -hmm. and they were short. We walked in. You know, you know how would they like if you go to some one of those events and they save seats for you, they put Leonard Malton and Leonard Malton on the two chairs. You know. And we got there. We looked. There's Haley Mills and Haley Mills. I thought, oh, they're both here. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, uh, Ben Varkenton wrote in time. Varkentine, some people will reach puberty with marriage. Hell more. Some of us had to settle for women on Night Rider. So anyway, uh, actually, to be honest with you, it wasn't Mary Tyler Moore for me. I'm sh ashamed to say it was Will and Grace. But anyway, um, let's see. Uh, who else wrote things here? Uh, uh, Doctor Empirical of Mice and Magic is great, just for reading and also as a reference book. That, That's that a book. Moment. Thank you. That book was important because everybody who did um, research on animation afterwards used that as like the overview. It was the first place I had ever seen the 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 the, 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 the lineage of all these studios. Who ran this and who went there and how, when they hired this and how the studios 
merged and people went back and forth between them. You know, it's like tracking Pinto Colvey going from studio to studio and, and things like that. And it, it made it very under, it, it, I felt like all the animation histories that came out afterwards were, de were based on using that as the Rosetta Stone to show where to look for all the other histories and, and things like that. Uh, well, uh, again, I'm grateful for the compliments and I'm also grateful that it's still in print. 40 years after it was first published. Now, you, you, you upgraded it once? You, you revised it once? Once, early on, 1985, five years into its life. I, I did a, a, a new final summing up chapter. So in that, I got to mention, if briefly, uh, The Simpsons, Birth of The Simpsons, the birth of, of uh, Animaniacs and the Spielberg produced cartoons and uh, the beginning of the Renaissance at Disney it just touched on these things, but at least I acknowledge them because people have asked if I ever, you know, plan to do a sequel or to expand the book. It, it requires another entire book. So much has happened in those 35 to 40 years and so much of significance has happened that to, to do it justice would require another, another whole book. Why don't you do another whole book? Uh, why don't you mind your own business? <laughs> yeah, are, you, are you working on a book right now? Is, is it... uh, I am working on a um, a reminiscence, I'll call it. Oh. Autobiography sounds too pompous to me. But okay. it, it's, a, it's a collection of my experiences meeting the great and the near great. Okay. Okay, now define for okay. Name three people you consider greats and three people you consider near greats. No. Okay. Well, speaking of greats, we, I see we have we have Jerry Beck is out there wa watching us. Another man who's done enormous things for animation history and and keeping track of all this stuff. And, yeah, and, he was uh, the one who researched all the filmographies forty years ago for of Mice and Magic. Um, Mauricio Restrepo, I apologize for mispronouncing it, of Mice and Magic was my textbook in Howard Beckerman's History of Animation class at the School of Visual Arts. And, and then... I, I remember Howard fondly from, uh, from living in New York. And Monica Jordan says, I just ordered of Mice and Magic. I should get it on July 2nd. Can't wait to read it. And uh, my pal Elaine Riggs says, the first time I saw Leonard was in person at his old cartoon classes at the New School in New York back in the early 90s, 80s rather. And uh, Daimondo said, I believe the first time I saw Leonard Mullen on TV was the Bugs and Daffy wartime cartoons VHS from MGM UA Home Video. Uh, and now, now here's the, okay. Too politically incorrect to exist anymore. <laughs> here, here, okay, here's an important question here. Uh, Rob Bernath says, always enjoy Leonard's segments of entertainment tonight. Does he stay in touch at all with Mary Hart or John Tesh? Every now and then. And uh, one of the places I see Mary Hart is at the Jewish High Holy Day services. We belong to the same synagogue. Uh, she is a devoted, uh, she married a, a Jewish man, a Bert Sugarman, and though she never actually converted, she became a, a, a very a fervent follower of the religion. Really? Is yeah. she as per is she as perky in Temple as, as uh, she does <laughs> on the show? <laughs> what I can say truthfully about Mary is what you see is what you get. Okay. Um, Michael Saunders writes, hey, Leonard, when you were writing of Mice and Magic, were you surprised at a fact writing it? Did you, did you come across some discovery that just shocked you? I, I can't, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything, any one thing that kind of uh, jumped out at me. Uh, it was just putting all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. Uh, that was uh, the overall process that was that was fun and challenging at the same time. Okay. And here's a, here's a comment from our friend Paul Harris, who I did one of the my first one of these one on ones with. I'm really enjoying watching the two of you who each made multiple appearances on my radio show. Talk about a guy who was my guest more than both of you combined. Carl Reiner. Great stuff. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Paul. Paul. Um, uh, let's wrap up Carl Reiner. Briefly here, um, uh, it's a sh it's a shame. I mean, I I, I I got some angry letters this morning from people. I said in my little 
an obit for him on my blog that it's a shame that he uh, didn't get to see live to see uh, Donald Trump crash and burn completely because uh, he he if anybody didn't like the only negative things I ever saw about Carl were people attacking him for his his dislike of Donald Trump and we don't have to get into politics here but um, he took a, a very forceful stand for a guy in retirement and did a lot of t tweeting at, a, at an age when most men do not know how to use the internet he stayed very current you know with computers and, and online presence and tweets and things like that and uh, it also struck me and I had this is a warped thought that it's a shame that there can't be the we can't fill a huge auditorium right now with people who love Carl Reiner to tell Carl Reiner stories there's no mo I, I saw him at a number of memorial services mm -hmm. uh, when Howie Morris passed away uh, I was asked to be at this. I of course wanted to be at his, his the funeral, and they was asked to speak. And uh, I previously, and I, I don't do that. I'm not comfortable doing that. It intimidates me, especially when you're looking out and seeing people who belong at a microphone. I don't know, you know. When Lorenzo Music passed away, I was asked to speak, and I got there and found out I was slated to follow Bob Newhart to the microphone. Okay, it's intimidating enough to be up there at all. It's more intimidating to follow Bob Newhart and then have him in the front row when I'm speaking there. I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? I'm in front of the audience and he's in the audience. You know, uh, as it turned out, I didn't have to follow. They rearranged and I had to follow Jack Riley, which was almost as bad. I get to the memorial for Howie Morris and Howie's son says, I've got you slotted right after Carl. And I went, oh, no, no, don't do this to me. Don't. As it turned out, um, other people ran to the microphone. They, the, the rabbi didn't understand that there was an actual order. So he just invited anybody up, and other people went to the microphone ahead of me to the point where I just never got to the microphone because people were filibustering. But Carl Reiner, and I, I have to mention this, the speech he gave for Howie Morris was one of the the single greatest eulogy I ever saw in my life. It was about 15 minutes. It was fabulous. And I'll tell you the opening of it. They started the, mo the memorial service by showing the sketch, which every person watching this knows, that you bet the, uh, 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 this is your life takeoff. They started it, and there's Howie as Uncle Goopy coming out. It's, it's the funniest sketch ever done, probably. You know? In, in the history of mankind. And it was, we were all sitting there howling with laughter at it. So Carl got up and he talked about how he had not been able to see the sketch when it was originally done because it was live TV. He was in the sketch. He didn't get to see it. And he really didn't get to see it until, I don't know, you may know the year they brought out that 10 from your show of shows feature. And he said, I went to the um, theater and, there was, and I was laughing, at, and there was this high-pitched woman scream, scream. This woman was laughing so much, and she was laughing through all the sketches. And when they got to the, to the, to the "This Is Your Life" sketch, she was howling so loud I couldn't hear all the words. And I'm thinking to myself, "Oh God, that woman is is so, you know, loud. I wish she was a little quieter so I could see the, the sketch." And then I realized that woman was me. <laughs> And uh, he was just one, you know, they, he and Howie were, went back to the army together. They, they predated your show of shows. They, they were together in the army they, in doing shows for the troops. And uh, every actor in the place was sitting there thinking, oh, when I die, I hope I have, there's someone who can give as good a speech about me as, as Carl gave about Howie. It was, yeah. it was my, my admiration for Carl, which was already huge, grew. And his ability to get up there and speak extemporaneously. He, he wasn't reading a script or anything like that. He was just yeah. telling stories about Howie. And it was um, the kind of moment makes you realize how talented he was, that he could do that so freely and so off the top of his head. And he, and he just timed, and it was hysterically funny and touching at the same time. That's, that, that's my favorite Carl Reiner performance. So, anyway. Um, pardon? Sorry, I, we, we got here. I, I and I lost you there. I'm sorry. One more time. That I got. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're doing double talk now. Thank you. Uh, let's. Uh, okay. Before we, we before we part 
from this topic. I stuck a photo up in my little file here. There's Carl and Mary at some Emmy Awards ceremony where they were both getting a couple of them. And uh, that was about the way I remember Carl at the that Dick Van Dyke show filming that age. And Mary was, you know, the same at the same type of age and things like that. And I just, uh, um, you know, that, that kind of hit me. It's not like we, we didn't expect a 90 year old man to go, a 98 year old yeah. man to go. But um, I feel it's like a that's really a loss because he was such a yeah. wonderful man. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. now. Uh, next topic, I have this picture up here. These guys. Uh, I just got this today. This is uh, a new um, Blu-ray. I think there's a DVD version as well of restorations of Laurel and Hardy films. I've watched, since I talked to you earlier today, I watched about an hour of it, and it is quite wonderful. It is amazing to see those films restored these, so much these wonderful wonderful films that you and i and millions of others grew up watching on television when we were kids were part of a library that was sold and resold and licensed and relicensed while the original negatives and 35 millimeter materials uh were allowed to decompose in some cases uh and turn brittle and it's uh, it, very little short of a miracle that they have been rescued and rescued w with the help of a lot of money, but also a lot of love. Uh, the UCLA Film and Television Archive undertook this project with Jeff Joseph, uh, an independent producer and, and film buff who loves Laurel and Hardy. And what they ultimately did was they restored them twice First, they did a complete photochemical restoration. Uh, and uh, that's what you, we, we all see films that say restored. Sometimes it just means they struck a new print. But in this case, they really did. They re-recorded the soundtrack from the original elements. Uh, they reprinted, they fixed, you know, little glitches. And then they were digitally cleaned up. So they, they went through one final pass, one final step. And there are some things you can do digitally, in some cases with, with very little uh, sweat equity, that makes a difference. Digital is very good for image stabilization. You know, that kind of weave that old movies have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a bad illustration by me. Um, uh, they, can, they can paint out flecks and specks of dust and, and scratches. Um, and I haven't watched every inch of uh, the, those four discs, but I've sampled all, all four, and I've never seen these films look and sound so great. These are films that, that are like you, Mark, that are deep, burrowed deep in my consciousness, yeah. and I've never seen them looking like this. What is burrowed deep in my con consciousness, along with the films, and Hardy's takes and Laurel's lines and the pantomime and such is how I saw those movies cut up, chopped up on bad prints in bad places with commercials inserted with, I mean, to someone who uh, saw these films the way we saw them in the seventies on TV or sixties, rather in my case on the sixties, and even I think I even remember them vaguely from the end of the 50s when I was like seven. Uh, to see them this pristine is astounding. And something I thought would be fun to talk about in a minute is how home video has made all of our little fantasies come true. I used to have this dream of having a room in my house where I had a print of every Laurel and Hardy film and a projector and things like that. And I kind of have that now, but I don't need to thread a projector. I just needed a Blu-ray player and a DVD player and about a hundred bucks worth of these things. And you could have the full library looking better than they ever did and not worry about splicing and, and editing. And, and I, uh, I want to give a, another shout out to my old friend, Kit Parker. Uh, uh, Kit, uh, if, if anybody, uh, worked in any kind of function that involved renting 16 millimeter movie prints in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. 
you dealt with Kit Parker films and you dealt with the best. You dealt with Kit Parker films. They, they always went the extra mile, try to maintain the quality of the prints they were sending out and, uh, and to, to service the customers uh, to the very, the, their very best effort. Uh, Kit is now semi-retired, but in his semi-retirement, he is the, the uh, moving force behind this release. He has something called the Sprocket Vault, and that's the official distributor of this wonderful set of Laurel and Hardy. He also has done several volumes of uh, Charlie Chase talkie shorts and Thelma Todd and Zazu Pitts, Thelma Todd and Patsy Kelly. So he's exploring the entirety of the Hal Roach talkie library. When, when I was showing the, the thrill of it all, uh, watching it a couple weeks or two ago, I had a lady over here, a friend of mine, and when she saw in the opening titles the name Zazu Pitts, she has a small role in that, she said, oh, Zazu Pitts. I've always heard of Zazu Pitts. Point her out to me. I've never known who she was. And uh, she's kind of funny in that movie, as it turns out. She's funny in every movie she did. Um, anyway, uh, now, I'm going to, for the sake of starting what might be a tiny argument, I don't know, um, there are certain words, this, this is a recurring thing in my blog, there are certain words that people have rendered inoperative and useless by overusing them. The word legend is yeah. now applied to absolutely everybody who ever lived has been a legend in some way or shape. Everybody unless they're, is unless they're an icon. That's the other word, second word. And the third word that is now becoming completely overused to the point of its definition no longer has any real meaning whatsoever is on the cover of this. It says these are the definitive de restorations. Definitive kind of means there can never be any more better than this. Are we thinking that technology will not advance to the point and maybe, you know, lost films will turn up, prints will turn up, and nobody will ever make these films look even better than they do on this? I'm not complaining about how they look. I love how they look. I think it's fabulous that we have, as you, as you said, the best looking prints these movies have ever had. But are we, is this the end of the trail for the restoration of Laurel and Hardy movies? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I will, I will say that though I share your, uh, your, your ire at the overuse of those words. Every, you know, icon has come into popular usage, I think in just the last 15 years, 20 years or something. Yeah. I'll bet if you did a word search, through uh, newspaper files pre-1980, let's say, just for argument's sake, you, you would have a hard time finding the word icon in common usage. And uh, now you can't avoid it. Well, now it's and, a, now, you, now they're on your computer screen too, but yeah. you know, they're, they're but, uh, but, but these are definitive restorations. You, you think so? We're, ne we're never going to see a better looking print of Sons of the Desert than this? Ever? I'll go out on that limb. Okay. I'm, I'm just, I, I just don't think technology is stopping. I mean, okay, let's, let's, uh, we, all right. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Well, I, I'm satisfied with this because this is so much better than the way I saw that movie for 20, 30 years. And I saw that movie 20 times. I saw it with splices and bad cuts and and, and the and the photo galleries and yes. uh, collection of graphics from press books uh, yeah. and uh, original release art from all over the world where yeah because you know Stan and Ollie were were worldwide celebrities beloved every we nation, have everyone. We have here Sons of the Desert, The Battle of the Century, two different versions of Birthmarks with different soundtracks, Bratz plus another version of the alternate soundtrack, Hog Wild, Come Clean, One Good Turn, Me and My Pal, uh, Helpmates, The Music Box, The Chimp, County Hospital, Scram, Their First Mistake, The Midnight Patrol, Busy Buddies, Way Out West, Toad in a Hole, Twice Two, That's That, which is an outtake reel of Laurel Hardy stuff, and Tree in a Test Tube, which... Uh, it's the least funny thing they ever did. But um, some of my favorite Laurel and Hardy shorts are on here, features. Um, Just to say some of the funniest movies ever made. Yes, some of the funniest movies ever made. And 
what struck me in looking at the part of it I looked at today was it reminded me that one of the things I love about Laurel and Hardy is just watching them. Just watching them walk, just watching them, watching Hardy pick up a, a, a pen or, or anything, just a gestures. These guys were more interesting doing almost nothing than most people in comedies were. Um, I, I, is, is it apocryphal that Harold Lloyd used to turn to people on the set of a film and say, they'd say, okay, Harold, in this scene, you walk across the room and he'd say, what do I do to be funny? Because I don't know. Because Harold Lloyd himself was not funny. Usually, they put him in very funny situations mm -hmm. and dangling from funny build, dangling from funny buildings. But he himself was not that interesting to look at. The way Buster Keaton was interesting to just watch him, his right. body movements. And Oliver Hardy and Stan Laurel were just fascinating to look at. It's why I don't get that mad about their bad movies because at least they're moving and you see them, you get that. Yeah. No matter how bad the script was, you still see Hardy's gestures. You see Laurel's slow takes and reactions uh, that are to me just uh, the joy of, the joy of them is, is to watch those guys act without even doing anything. Right. Be the characters. Whereas we were looking at some of this the other night, my wife said, they don't have to do anything. I, I'm laughing already. And, and it, of course that's preconditioning. But it's preconditioning because you know how funny they are, and that uh, their everything, their uh, just their presence, not to mention their body language, not to mention their agility uh, and their, uh, uh, their their facial expressions and and uh, and voices. Here's one of the things that fascinates me about Laurel and Hardy. If you had, if they come along five years later than they did and you were going to pair these two uh working stiffs you know journeyman com comic actors together would you pick one guy from england and one guy from deep in georgia with their you know seemingly incompatible accents and make them a team i don't no. think that make make much sense and, and what, what's all awesome. yeah, okay? So I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, uh, but of course, the, the voices work great. And what always interested me also was that when people do Laurel and Hardy imitations, frequently they merge them. Johnny Carson, whenever he would do what, a Laurel and Hardy line, you know, to Ed McMahon, he would basically be doing Laurel and Hardy at the same time. He'd be doing a little of that and a little. They were like. He, there was no difference. It wasn't like this is Hardy's line or Laurel's line. It was the Laurel and Hardy line. They both say it together, and they kind of merged uh, these amateur impressions of them. Speaking of talk shows, you mentioned Johnny Carson. I'm grateful that they did not exist in the same era as talk shows. Uh, they made occasional radio appearances. Uh, and uh, there, there was a publication just last year uh, which preserved some of those. Um, but radio was not their medium. Uh, they were too much uh, uh, married to their, their physicality and their, and their faces. But they never were put in the position of having to reveal who they really were to the public. That's right. So the only, the only image of Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy that we in the audience ever got was in character. Therefore, we had no reason to ever question or disbelieve that they were those guys. Well, and they used their own names. That's right. Yeah, they weren't playing character or their names. Uh, there's a couple of places where uh, I watched, actually watched not a lot long ago, uh, the Fighting Kentuckian, where Oliver mm -hmm. Hardy is with all, it was with in a John Wayne movie of all places. Um, uh, that movie, by the way, is a reason to tear down the statues of John Wayne and rename the airport right there. But but he's great in that film, and it, and and as with Zenobia, you you do have to get reminded occasionally. Oh yeah, he's an actor. They didn't just find these two guys who were really like that and put them in front of a camera. Yeah. Uh, uh, but there's, uh, there's yeah. 
fortunately, both of those films were well suited to him. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I also finally saw um, was it Riding High, the Capra film that he's got the cameo yeah. in. Yeah, and he's he just steals those scenes. He's so funny in them. Um, I wonder what the if the audience was like waiting for Laurel to show up in those scenes, figuring where, where Stan, but uh, uh, not not. Maybe Mr. Capra's greatest movie, but it was it was. They're all easy to kind of watch. They're all they're all they all got such good character actors in them that you can. Oh yes. Put up with a lot of that. Um, but uh, uh, do you okay? Now we've been discussing on my blog for a while. What is the the Marx Brothers film you show to someone who's never seen a Marx Brothers film before? Let's ask if you if uh, uh, you've been teaching film classes. If you're if you've got a class of students who have never seen Laurel and Hardy before, what would what would be your first choice to introduce them to Laurel and Hardy? What film? My knee-jerk answer is the music box. Uh, because it's great and because it sets them up pretty well and then has them doing such wonderful vignettes and uh, routines. And uh, it's it's very visual. It's uh, it's wonderfully funny. Uh, but uh, I think that's a very user friendly film. What what feature would you show people? Probably Sons of the Desert, because there there there's so much Stan and Ollie in, in that film, and. Uh, the situation, you know, uh, trying to uh, put one over on the wives is emblematic Laurel and Hardy material. And uh, it's just, you know, I'm running out of superlatives, Mark. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, all right. The, the film that I would show, uh, Music Box is, of course, wonderful. Um, I would be fine to show them Toad in a Hole, which I think is one of the best shorts. Best setup, I think, of any. Laurel and Hardy film. Yeah, and it's all them. There's nobody else in the whole film. Uh, it, it opens with them driving their their, their truck, their, their fish uh, mongers truck, and sitting happy. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Oliver talks about what a beautiful day it is, a perfect morning to be out doing what they're doing, and they're finally employed and making money. And Stan says, I have an idea. <laughs> And it goes from there. And and their dialogue is so indicative of the characters they're playing, so perfectly indicative of those char the characters that they're uh, indelibly attached to, that uh, everything that follows, which is, you know, uh, psych gags to slapstick of a very high order, uh, happens because of who they are character drives the comedy always yeah some people once i forget where this was somebody who is known for doing montages of scenes for movies put together a laurel and hardy montage of just gags and it wasn't funny because they had none of the setup they had none of the context that made those gags funny because it was Stan and Ollie who were participating in those gags. Yeah. Well, you, once you lose their rhythms, you lose them. That's yeah. the problem with montages. It's, it's uh, I, I find their rhythm funny. I find them. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the Laurel and Hardy film that I would show someone, the feature I would show someone, because when I've seen these films with audiences, it invariably gets the biggest reaction is Our Relations, which really? is not one that people frequently mention. But I've seen that film a half dozen times with good audiences, and it gets more laughs. The, the last half hour, the audience does not stop laughing. It's just one continuous. It builds and builds and builds. And it has so much Laurel Hardy that they're in it twice. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they play twins. And it's got a little bit of everything in it. It's got uh, them getting away from the wives. It's got one of those reciprocal dis destruction scenes. It's got uh, uh, some nice production values. There's a couple of beautiful sets in there, and it looks kind of lavish. 
and uh, it just keeps going. And, and it's got Jimmy Finlayson. Uh, that's all, which is always a good thing for a Lorna Hardy film. Um, uh, so that just, uh, no, it's a very wonderful film. And uh, I, uh, um, well, yeah, I just still love love to watch these guys, and I just love that I've got this thing here. It's it's, uh, um, you know, we we haven't had a lot of good news in the world lately, and no, but this and, is a this is a, a, a genuinely a cause for celebration. Yeah, this is a great great project, and uh, there's people who are going to carp about oh they could have made it better here and there. Uh, you, you've been the victim, I know, of a couple of times when DVD sets came out and people just had kind of unreasonable criticisms of, well, why didn't these two spend thousands of more dollars and, and do this and such? And I think, um, you know, I, I mean, I remember when the idea that you could own your favorite movies was science fiction. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that you could have, I remember going to see the producers when it first came out and my friends and I sat through it twice because we thought, well, when are we ever going to see this movie again? You know, we thought it was going to go away, it would close, and we'd never get to see it. Or if we saw it, it would be on television with commercials and they'd cut out some jokes and it would be bad print. I, 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 I like you, I, I assume like you, I just used to grind my teeth watching movies on television. It was all we had sometimes, the only way to see some of those films. Yeah. And now I, now I can't, could never go back and watch them that way. I've been no, spoiled. Of course, of course uh, we're spoiled. And how fortunate that, that we've been spoiled. I actually tried to watch some movie on television not long ago. And every time they went for a commercial, I wanted to kind of click on the lower right hand corner and, and, and jump, you know, skip the ad. It wasn't there on the TV screen. I mean, I thought it was, I was from watching YouTube so much. I, I think you can get past every commercial. Um, but it was a just, uh, and I just am so happy that we have all these restorations that you have. have uh, are there movies that you want to see that you can't see now? Are there, film, there are films that are missing from home video that are important? Leave us, let's leave aside Song of the South, which I think is has part of its reputation because of its unavailability. I don't think it's as yeah. wonderful a movie as a lot of people do. And and if you look hard enough, you can find it. It's around. It's It was on YouTube for five or six years. The whole thing was on YouTube while people were complaining that it was a banned film that was being held from be. them. It, pardon? It may still be. It, it could still be, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we had people complaining that Gone with the Wind was going away, and it was it was it was hard to find for about three minutes. It's still yeah. on. You can still watch it on Amazon. You can buy the DVD on Amazon, and now apparently it's it's now on HBO Max. You know, um, nothing 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 goes away if there's an audience that'll pay to see it. That's right. Um, anyway, but is there is there some film that you that you're uh, Remember how we used to have this thing going about the the Maury Amsterdam Rosemary movie? Don't worry, we'll think of a title. Yes, yes. I I had seen this movie. Maury Amsterdam in the '60s got together a bunch of his friends, including Carl Reiner was in the film, uh, and they made a movie called "Don't Worry, We'll Think of a Title," that was shot. It was shot on the stage where they did the Dick Van Dyke show. It was shot during hiatus, and it has Mo Howard's in it and Milton Berle. And uh, uh, God, I can't remember who else is in it. A lot of uh, 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 Irene Ryan is in it in her Beverly Hillbilly suit. <laughs> and she just came over. And she just came over from the set and did a, did a part in it. And it's you can tell Maury Amsterdam wrote it because every other line is a joke that is out of context. It's it's like it's the kind of jokes he used to tell when people would be going talk shows. And people would say, "Give me a joke about a kangaroo." <laughs> you know? And I saw that movie. We were uh, my parents and I were in Pismo Beach one summer for a couple days, and it was playing at the local movie, the only movie theater in the town. And there was not even a poster for it; they had a hand painted poster. There was no, there was no one sheet, and we saw it there. And it's not a great film, but it was a movie that I had seen and Leonard hadn't. <laughs> and I, I lorded it over him for years. And then one day, somebody called me up and they said. They're running it on Turner Classic Movies right now. And I quickly turned it on and it just started. And I called Leonard and he and, and, and you remember I you said, I'm watching it right now. <laughs> you were you were so pleased that I do, I could no longer lord that over you. 
Now, have and, you also seen, has, have you also now seen The Fat Spy with Jackie Leonard? No, I haven't. Should I? I haven't seen it. I oh. believe it's now uh, possible to find it. Oh, okay. Well, it's, uh, on that, it's on that really rainy day list. Yeah. Uh, 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 somebody just said uh, uh, J. Scott 1520, Zots with Tom Poston is a rarity. Have you seen Zots? Uh, not, not since it first came out. I was a William Castle camp follower and uh, I saw almost all of his movies on their original release. Uh, okay. We, I am told there is an HD print of the Song of the South on the Internet Archive. What is it doing there? It's not a PD film, as far as I know. Um, uh, and uh, Enter Laughing has never been on DVD or Blu-ray. A shame. Yeah, there are, there are quite a number of films like that, which is to say not classics necessarily, not uh, hugely sought after titles, but just library titles from the, the enormous inventories of Columbia Pictures, Universal Pictures, Paramount, excuse me, Paramount, 20th Century Fox, on down the line. And there, you know, that that's the kind of film that I uh, I get pleasure out of seeing. Maybe you'll, they'll, you'll, you'll find a hidden gem. Maybe you'll find a, uh, you know, a performance or a sequence that's memorable or that's worth, uh, you know, curating or, or highlighting. Uh, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of titles like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ben Varkentine says, excuse me, I think the animated sequences in Song of the South should be preserved. I think the whole film should be preserved. I just think people uh, are building up how important the film it is beyond, out of proportion because of its unavailability. I don't think it's that wonderful a film. It, it should be seen. People should have access to it. But I think people, you know, it's like... Um, there's a couple of things. Um, uh, since we're talking about Carl Reiner, uh, they tried syndicating briefly your show of shows. And your show of shows was not as wonderful when people when it was available. The whole thing, you know, the, the best of your show of shows is wonderful. There's a lot of wonderful sketches on there. But when they started trying to cut them into half hours to put them in syndication, um, they were a little disappointing. The re they didn't live up to their reputation. There's a lot of stuff that is is uh, hailed as great. Uh, the anticipation is, is too great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jerry Betts wants to know, have you guys seen The Finks? Finally. That, that <laughs> took me decades to catch up with, Jerry. And uh, it wasn't worth the wait. <laughs> Jerry <laughs> says... That was made at Warner Brothers and by Warner Brothers, uh, written by or, or co-written by Stan Cornyn, who was an executive at Warner Brothers Music, who wrote liner notes and produced albums. Uh, and I think the premise, Jerry will correct me, uh, is that some billionaire, for reasons I don't understand or remember, wants to show how powerful he is, so he kidnaps and holds hostage all of the world's uh, uh, pop culture icons. There's the word icon again, uh, meaning Johnny Weissmuller as Tarzan and uh, uh, the Lone Ranger and Tonto and uh, Ruby Keeler and uh, just a, a, a grab bag list of performers, wonderful performers, who get very little to do in the film, except show their faces. And um, the movie is uh, pretty uh, bad. But I, I, I had printed a still, they issued one still of that whole group seated in, you know, like, like hotel type chairs. And uh, it fascinated me and uh, intrigued me no end until I saw it. Uh, what is your what was your rating of uh, Skidoo? It's been too many years since I've seen Skidoo, and I have seen Skidoo to have a coherent memory of it. Uh, and it's a film that is largely incoherent, so uh, I, I'm going to have to 
give that one more shot. Uh, here's a film that is not available to be seen, uh, except if you find a, 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 an older collector with a 16 millimeter library print. It's the 1940 adaptation of Swiss Family Robinson, starring Thomas Mitchell and Freddie Bartholomew. And uh, the reason you can't see it is that when Walt Disney decided to do his own version of Swiss Family Robinson, he bought not only the, the uh, rights to the title, but he bought the rights to the 1940 RKO film. And they have sat on it ever since. And I saw a 16 millimeter collector's copy. It's not a great film, but it's an interesting film. It's made by a number of the same people who made Citizen Kane within the year. Orson Welles does the opening narration, in fact. And it's a, uh, uh, it's a film that shouldn't be uh, buried. Uh, it, it can exist quite uh, happily alongside the Disney family friendly remake, uh, which is, you know, not exactly faithful to the, to the literary source. Uh, so you can have version one and version two. Okay. Um, you know, uh, getting back to Skidoo for a second, I had this friend, Stanley Ralph Ross. You may cross paths yep. with Stanley at some point. And Stanley claimed that he ghost wrote um, on Skidoo. He came in and did uh, punch up on the script and rewrote on it. And that at the they had a premiere and showed the film to the cast and crew one of those big things, and someone ran the reels out of order and nobody noticed. That's, I don't know, I, I never knew whether to believe Stanley on stuff like that, but that doesn't sound like something you'd make up. I mean, Why it's, spoil a good story, Mark? Pardon? Oh, sorry? Say it again? Why spoil a good story? It's a good story. I hope it's true. Um, uh, and another film that's, that's unavailable, I mentioned earlier, The Art of Love with Dick Van Dyke. Is, yeah. Are hard to see. It's 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 on it's on a DVD in other countries, but it's not on in Region One anywhere, as far as I know. Uh, so uh, let's see um, who else has some questions here. Uh, uh, Jerry Beck just said, "LOL, love Stanley Ralph Ross." Yes, <laughs> Stanley. We I, if I were if Stanley were still around and I started doing these. He would be on every week. He would not let me interview anyone else. He would just be here telling stories, um, some of them even true. Uh, and he was just such a character. Uh, I, I, I I miss the good Stanley. I don't miss the bad Stanley. But uh, um, uh, let's see. There's somebody we had. Wait a minute. Somebody I missed somebody uh, here who said something. I. Wanted to quote here. Uh, oh, uh, Anthony Tom, my friend Anthony. Uh, John Hart recalled that the Finks was, however, a lot of fun to film, much more fun than to view. Leonard, it was the nation of Albania who kidnapped the icons to demoralize America. Thank you. Thank you for, yes. for clarifying that. Yes. And we all know nothing can demoralize America. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, Camden Spies, Spies. Camden, she married a cop isn't available. It's great because of its connection with Warner cartoons. I don't, I don't know what's the connection to Warner cartoons in that one. We'll find right. out. I oh, okay. Uh, Hell's a poppin. Hell's a poppin's around. Well, that's right. Hell's a poppin is still officially unavailable in the United States. It's available in Canada, I believe. Has been shown on uh, Canadian television. Uh, but the U.S. rights still involve the estates of Ole Olson and Chick Johnson. Uh -huh. And no one has seen fit to negotiate uh, or pay off uh, the, uh, the families or descendants to, uh, to clear up uh, that snag. So Hell's a Poppin', which is, uh, you know, a film of merit and really ought to be seen can't be seen again except if you have a friend of a friend who has a bootleg copy i thought it was that ray bolger and where's charlie okay there's, well there's a lot of mu musicals that have sometimes have a problem because of the source material yeah right that's why animal crackers was tied up for a, yeah uh, for years until steve stollier came to his rescue uh, 
so um, let's see. Wait, wait. Um, dare I ask this question here? Somebody wrote, what do you guys think of the new Looney Tunes cartoons and HBO Max? I think I don't have HBO Max and I haven't seen it. I assume. Have you have you looked at any new Looney Tunes? No. Okay. I and G. Gersten wrote, guillotine, guillotine. And I may be the only person who gets that because that's a running gag in The Art of Love. It's a very funny gag. And and nobody else. Someday you'll see that film if you haven't already, and you'll you'll laugh at the fact that he he said that. Uh, uh, let's see. Anyway, this boy, we got a lot of the, the audience is doing my job here for me. Uh, I, I passed passed up a couple of questions here. I know that uh, uh, people were asking. Uh, 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 oh, Camden also asked. Uh, uh, last semester, I argued with my film history professor that Laurel and Hardy had to refilm if the films were in another language. He said in she the, didn't believe me. In the earliest days of talkies. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't just Laurel and Hardy. It was even the Our Gang Kids, uh, which is astonishing uh, because they were still pictured that Robert McGowan, who was really the, the uh, director uh, of note, of the R Gang silent films. He, he, he brought the series to fruition. And um, he could direct those kids while they were shooting in the silent era. Okay, uh, Farina, go over there and now put the dog inside that box. As in, now walk away from the box like you don't care anymore. He could direct them all through the film. Suddenly, sound comes, and not only can't he do that, but they have to now memorize dialogue which they've never had to do before. So that, that would be enough of a, you know, uh, an a, accomplishment and a big one. Then they had to do multiple foreign language versions of their early talkies, as did Laurel and Hardy, as did Charlie Chase, as did Harry Langdon, who was then making a series for Hal Roach. And these are absolutely fascinating to watch. Yeah, I've so, seen a bunch and, of them, yeah. And in some so, cases, you've got new and additional footage. Uh, what's the one with, well, is it um, Be Big is like 40 minutes longer in the foreign edition. They put in all these variety acts. Chickens Come Home is one of them. Oh, yeah, that's right. Finlayson is in a, is a, is in a lot of those foreign acts. They, mm -hmm. He was like the stooge in them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those are fascinating. I wonder if any if anybody has ever, I guess when they do the restorations, they don't pull scenes out of those things. But there's alternate you know they were they were shoot when they were shooting these films even in silent films they were sometimes running two cameras side by side in many cases to create two negatives in the film and yeah. so there's like there's two versions of two slightly different versions of the gold rush from different angles yeah the, the, the overseas version of it the, the most famous uh, foreign language version of american uh, talkie of course is the spanish language dracula which has been put into circulation it's on uh, dvd and video and it's fascinating because it takes a somewhat different approach than Todd Browning did to that film. And it does not have Bela Lugosi, uh, but a very good actor, you know, playing a very creepy uh, Count Dracula. And one of the uh, uh, women he seduces uh, is um, was the woman who, uh, Lupita Tovar, a star of uh, Mexican films primarily, who married the famous uh, talent uh, agent and producer, Paul Koner. And uh, I got to interview her about the Spanish language Dracula when they released it on video. And she was just a charming woman. And her sons are uh, Paul Weitz and Chris Weitz, who made American Pie and wrote Ants and who've done many other uh, uh, films on their own individually. So they have good bloodlines. Uh huh. Um, uh, and Boris Karloff was in the French version of Pardon Us. Am I right? Uh, yes, and uh, I think yes. And Charles Boyer did did something. Uh, I'm trying to remember what his connection uh, point is. I should have a computer set up in front of me to remind me of all these mental notes that are now slipping away. Uh, now we got a discussion going on here in the in the group here. 
um, Peter Sanderson. Hi, Peter. Is there really a Where's Charlie film with Ray Bolger who did it on stage, as you said? I remember seeing a Where's Charlie film decades ago on TV, but Jack Benny played the real lead role. Now, that's no, the difference between, between Charlie's aunt and Where's Charlie. That's right. Where's so, Charlie is the, is the Broadway. You're, you're overlapping version. different uh, entities. Uh, Jack Benny did play uh, the title role in Charlie's Aunt, 1941, I think, at Fox, 20th Century Fox. And then a decade later, after the great Broadway success of uh, the musical, Frank Lesser's musical, Where's Charlie? Ray Bolger recreated his Broadway performance on film for Warner Brothers. And it's a Technicolor movie. And um, uh, it's a significant movie. And it's a big hole that's missing from the history of, uh, of American musical films. Okay, and uh, David Pedigo reminds us, Oklahoma also had two versions, one filmed in Tadeo and another totally redone takes filmed in 35 millimeter. Yep. Uh, uh, that must play havoc with deciding what the, the definitive version. Uh, my, my, friend, my friend Kevin Burns did a, a, produced a wonderful special that is out on DVD called The Sound of Their Music about all the films of Rodgers and Hammerstein. And he does side-by-side -side comparison shots of Oklahoma in both formats. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there an appreciable difference? Is it yeah, terribly it's different? It, it, it is different. Okay. Uh, when uh, I, I interviewed Stanley Don and I wanted to ask him about Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, uh, and he confirmed that it was shot twice. They would shoot it once in scope, cinema scope, which was brand new. And then as, uh, as Russ Tamblin, I think, told me, then he was, all right, moving closer, everybody. <laughs> they would shoot the same sequence for the standard size screen. And there were two editing rooms going simultaneously, uh, assembling the two uh, prints. Wow, I didn't know that about that film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Disney did that with Lady and the Tramp because not every theater bought into the idea of CinemaScope right away. It meant, you know, building an entirely new screen, putting in a new speaker system and, um, and spending money uh, the way theaters were, uh, uh, were sort of blackmailed into doing for 3D a decade ago. St Stanley Donan directed a film that I loved that got very little notice. I don't know if you were a fan of it. Movie, movie. Oh yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah, that's uh, and there's two versions of that because they would make they made the first act in color in some prints and in black and white in the other. The first of the two movies in it. Uh, another movie George Burns was in also. Yeah, and uh, uh, I just love it. I have this a copy of the screenplay for Movie, Movie Two which Gelbart gave me. They, he wrote it, and they were going to go into production with it, and then somehow the deal fell through, and Movie Movie 2, at least on paper, sounds even funnier than Movie Movie 1 to read it. Uh, it's a, uh, a fine... For, for years, I had this guy named Stanley who was calling me to ask me computer questions. Someone had given him my number, and he's obviously an older guy who'd gotten a PC, and he didn't know how to, and he'd call me up every so often and say, how do I do this in Microsoft Word? And I would tell him. And I didn't know really who he was, but he was polite and nice to me. And I found out after like the fifth call, it was Stanley Donan. <laughs> and I didn't know who it was. And and we had a wonderful conversation about movie, movie, and singing in the rain, and all these things. And he, he told me that for movie, movie, um, the film was developed for Walter Matthau to play the part George C. Scott played. And then Walter got offered something else and went away and they decided to get George C. Scott, who, you know, was not known for great comedy performances on film, but he's wonderful in that film. He's just so good in it. Um, uh, lovely performance in that film. So anyway, uh, uh, Richard Gersh says, uh, Frank Sinatra dropped out of Carousel because he did not want to film his scenes twice. Apparently, that is the story. Yeah, well, you should have you should have made that film twice and not made some of your other ones, Frank. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, does anybody and anybody in the chat room have another 
strange movie they want to want to talk about. We've got a few more minutes here. I don't want to keep Leonard up past his bedtime. But uh, 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 Jay Scott said, "Man, the barn building scene in Oklahoma must have been a nightmare issue twice." Are we talking? Are you thinking of of Seven Brides, the barn building raising scene in that? Um, I don't remember a barn building scene in Oklahoma, but. Uh, uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers is, is quite a wonderful film, and uh, sure. it, it's really a very good film, and it's kind of fun my to watch. Wife's favorite movie, my wife's favorite movie, and my daughter's favorite movie, too. Really? And, yeah, really, and we showed it to her when the laser discs were just coming on the scene, and so I was able to just show her the, the barn raising scene and uh, the big dance number that surrounds it. And she loved it. The first thing she said was, again, to one click, I was able to, you know, cue it up and show it again. And she said, again. And so we watched it something like five or six times in a row. And then every day it became a ritual. She had to watch it multiple times. And I, after several weeks, I said, uh, want to watch the movie from the beginning? No. But one day I let it play at the end of that big number. And she started to become intrigued with who were these guys. And finally, ultimately, she saw the whole film, fell in love with the whole film, and uh, has never fallen out of love with it. And about, oh gosh, five, six years ago, uh, I got to interview Jane Powell before a screening of it uh, at the TCM Classic Film Festival. And, uh, and so, my wife, my daughter, and I all sat there together and got to watch Seven Brides on the big screen, which was just a big moment, big family moment. That's a, that, I've never seen that on the big screen. That'd be very interesting to see up mm -hmm. there. They, they, uh, uh, I've watched it a number of times. Remember we were at that thing a couple, about six, eight months ago, where Julie Newmar that yeah. private screening thing, and I, I got to walk Julie in. I was, I, <laughs> I got to, I got to put my arms around Julie Newmar and walk her into the, the event there. And it was, and we were, we started talking about Seven Brides. I, I think that was her first film, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it was. Yes, and uh, we got to talk about because I just seen it recently there, and she just talked about how, how much time she spent sitting around. <laughs> See, see, you know, that's where I learned shooting movies is not glamorous. You have to sit there while they do no. multiple takes and multiple takes, and, and that film uh, uh, is is a problem that way. Uh, oh, you know, I was remember I was going to ask you about this. Uh, I also went uh, last year to a thing called Molten Fest at the Egyptian Theater, where you were showing movies that had not gotten enough attention, which was a great idea. And that's where I first experienced a film I had missed completely, Big Eyes, which I thought was a really wonderful movie. It's a terrific and, film. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I was, I, I couldn't, I was on a deadline that weekend, so I couldn't come to everything. So I had to, but I, I came for that. And then I came the next night because a friend of mine who I brought wanted to see um, Absolute Beginners, mm -hmm. which she had not seen in a long time and I had not seen in a long time. And you were running Absolute Beginners. Followed by Bella Lugosi meets a Brooklyn it's gorilla, perfect. a beautiful, pristine print of a movie that I thought should have been transferred to flammable nitrate stock to get rid of it. But, but uh, so after the uh, we saw for, uh, Absolute Beginners and we enjoyed it tremendously. It's a it's an amazing film. It's one of those films I think you have to see three or four times to, to even fully appreciate all that's going on in it. And then then you, you know you had a little talk about Bella Lugosi meets a book. And I said to her, could we stay for some of this? We don't stay for all of it. Could we stay for some of this film? And I said, she said, okay, fine for you. So we're sitting, we were sitting in the back row of the Egyptian and the film starts. And I think we were like five minutes into it. And she said, seen enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think I have. <laughs> um, and we, we, we split at that point. But uh, well, we had plans in place for Malton Fest 2, which was to have taken place to be the first weekend in May this year. Uh, and we look forward to the day in the not too distant future when we can announce the return of Malton Fest. 
name a movie that you'd love to show at Malton Fest, whether you can get it or not. Name a couple movies that 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 you think like 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 uh, uh, Big Eyes. People will fall in love with it if they just have attention called to them. There's a film called The Ballad of Little Joe, uh, starring uh, uh, Susie Amos, who's now Mrs. James Cameron, has been for a long time, and um, it's made by a very talented writer director named Maggie Greenwald, and uh, it. It was inspired by a newspaper clipping that she came upon. It was an obituary notice for a woman who had died uh, in the Old West, late 1800s. And it turned out that when, and she was not married, when they were preparing her for burial, they discovered that this woman was in fact a man who'd been living his life as a woman because, as you find out in the course of the film, there was no, there was no real place for a single woman in the West. Either you came out and got married or you became a, uh, you know, a prostitute. Nowadays, we call them sex workers, but became a prostitute. Uh, those were your options, pretty much one or the other. So this woman chooses neither. She chooses to disguise herself as a man and becomes a successful rancher. And it's a facet. It's, it's not based on anything truthful except the the uh, uh, the spirit of the time. And it's uh, really well done. The ballad of Little Joe. All right. Are you going to try to show that in Malton Fest too, or if you can well, get it? Okay. Um, G. Gersten says. Suggest the private lives of Adam and Eve with Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney plays the snake in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> yes, he's the right height for it. Uh, Peter Sanderson says Julie Newmar can be seen in the girl hunt sequence in the bandwagon, which came out the year before Seven Brides. This is what I get for not mentioning that. I, I thought of that. But we're not being competitive. So that's, okay. That's okay. okay. Now, here, here's my last question. We're going to let you go. So, no, no more movies, folks. Uh, you and I were out, went out to Santa Monica one time to see Paul Winchell, who uh, I yes. think was his last live performance. And we were walking from Boca de Beppo, where we ate dinner, to the theater, which was about three blocks down. And you got stopped by a couple that recognized you from ET or someplace, or the or the spine of your book, whatever they recognized you for. And they, this couple came up to you and they said. We can't find good movies these days that have beginnings, middle, and endings. Can you recommend a film we would enjoy now that has a real, honest-to-God story being told? And you stopped and very patiently talked to them for about six minutes. Remember, you kept asking me, are we okay? We got time? And I said, yeah, you do. And you gave them some very good advice. I don't remember what the films you recommended were. When you get recognized by strangers, what do they ask you? You, what what kind what kind of questions do you get when you get recognized? You you have this reputation for being a very very knowledgeable about movies and b doing honest to god reviews that are not about how smart you are or how funny you can be that actually talk about the movie with some sort of you know even if I don't agree with you I I always find that your reviews are thought out well and respectful and that you're not out to, to you know dance on the grave of someone who made a bad movie such what what questions do people ask you seen any good movies lately <laughs> is that the only one that's that's pretty much it but uh it's, it's more specific than it's something like the conversation you just described and uh if pressed i will say uh, have you seen uh, I'm looking, looking after it. My, my brain just went dead, so I have to look this up. The Lookout, 2007. The Lookout. It's a thriller. It's so clever. It was written and directed by Scott Frank, who uh, did the adaptations of, of uh, Elmore Leonard's Get Shorty and uh, uh, other really good films. And, and this was his first chance to direct one of his own screenplays. 
And one of the reasons that it had a heart, it's perfectly cast, but he did not cast stars from marquee value. So at the time, people didn't know who Joseph Gordon-Levitt was, or if they did, they, they knew he was the kid on Third Rock from the Sun. It's Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Jeff Daniels, Matthew Good, Isla Fisher, Carla Gugino, Bruce McGill, uh, Alex Borston, uh, a lot of good, good people. And it's a very clever film. And that's one that I always recommend. Uh, I also recommend uh, a couple of decades earlier, David Mamet's House of Games, which is also a very twisty and uh, entertaining film about con artists. Okay. You know, when, when you were coming out here for Entertainment Tonight commuting, before Alice had moved out, you took me a few times to screenings with you before she took my job. And I remember we went to see uh, 48 Hours, the uh, film, and, and, and you turned to me during the barroom scene and just said, Eddie Murphy just became a, me a mega star or something like that. And, and, and it was absolutely true. And then you took me to see the Supergirl movie with Helen, was it Slater, Shaver? Yeah. Helen? yeah. And I turned to you 20 minutes into you and I said, there will be no sequels. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I, I, I kind of miss, well, I'm not trying to displace Alice, but I, I kind of, I, I like seeing movies that I know nothing about. One Me of the too. reasons I don't see more movies is that by the time I could go, I could go see this film, I've seen the previews, I've seen the commercials, I've seen reviews, I've seen clips on talk shows, and I just don't want to go to them. And I liked the fact that you invited me to movies that I could not have seen in advance, and I, I thank you for that. And I thank you for this time you spent with us. We're gonna we're gonna wrap this up here now, um, Leonard. We this is the way Leonard and I always are. We're together. We talk for hours about movies like this, um, and uh, uh, it's fascinating. We you and I have we, we have disagreed on one movie I think in all the time we've known you. And we I, I, I so I said not to mention Stan and Ollie here tonight, <laughs> but but. Um, you have you have always been a uh, an example of how I wish every film person who writes about film was knowledgeable and 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 not trying to not taking the reviews as a chance to show how funny you are. You're writing reviews that are actual reviews and that have uh, historical data in them, so you can look back. You know, we could read your reviews in the future and look back and understand not only what the movie was, but understand the context of the times in which it came out and what it, and what it represented the movie business at the time. Uh, the, your your reviews are very timeless, and I think that you know, long after you and I are gone, people will be reading your reviews of movies to understand the impact they had on the public, and uh, and also you know, building on all this great scholarship you've done. And I thank you for spending this time with us. And uh, folks, this if you came in the middle of this, as many of you did, uh, this whole video will rerun on YouTube ad infinitum after we, we log off here. Uh, and uh, people will, will move in. I will be back here every Tuesday evening for the foreseeable future with some friend. I must have somebody else who's as, as interesting as Leonard to talk to next week. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for joining us. And thank you, Leonard. And I'm going to say good night now for everybody. Good night. Bye, folks.